Hey everyone, welcome to Taking the Pulse, a healthcare and life sciences video podcast. I am Heather Hoops Matthews here in the studio today with Matthew Roberts, a healthcare attorney at Maynard Nexon. Matthew, good to be with you. Good to see you. And we're joined today by Ann Lewis. She is the CEO of Care South, an FQHA or federally qualified health center. They, they have locations throughout the PD region in South Carolina, and quite frankly, Anne is a pioneer in her field. She spent over four decades working to address the health care needs of her community. Anne, thank you so much for joining us today. It is a real honor, and I am very humbled to have been asked. Well, thank you. I know we're going to learn a lot from you today. Would you start us off just by talking about Care South? Tell us about the organization. I would love to do that. Unfortunately, I could do that all day long, so I will be very brief. We are a federally qualified health center, also known as a community health center. We are in the five counties that are part of the PD, Dillon, Marlboro, Chesterfield, Darlington, and Lee counties, with 13 offices in local communities, also five mobile vans, they can run around to different locations doing school-based services or um, whatever services are in need in any of the communities. We've been in business since 1980. We started very small with one office, four other staff, including myself. And now we're up to all of these offices and a little over 600 employees. We've had a lot wow. of change. <laughs> And you have been, if I correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you're the longest serving CEO of an FQHC in South Carolina, and you've been a CEO for 43 years at CareSouth? That is correct. So over that time period, which is an unbelievable uh, accomplishment, um, and obviously you just discussed the growth of CareSouth from being one office to now you know, multiple offices and, and serving those five counties so well. What have you learned, and I'm sure it's, it, could, it could take up, it could take an hour or plus to answer this. What have you learned about re- leading healthcare providers uh, during this period? Because a lot's changed over the years. Oh, yeah, yeah, a lot has changed. Healthcare providers are, are comfortable being part of a team. You know, when we started, we were just medically focused, but having dental, behavioral health, wellness, Um, all of those different attributes of the whole body care approach to the patient, that gives them an environment that they they really can feel confident in. Uh, They can know that the needs of the patient are being addressed in a multiple manner. And providers also, and this this is interesting, I've been at a meeting in, in Washington recently, and part of the discussion is around providers. We all know about the great resignation. And honestly, at Care South, we have experienced trauma in that area. We've, we've had very good tenure. What providers, in my experience, are looking for is purposeful, meaningful ways to accomplish why they went into medicine, helping people. They don't want to be a checkoff box on somebody's productivity spreadsheet. Uh, or, or, you know, um, um, bottom line, uh, own somebody's other P&L. So purposeful, meaningful practice really seems to be the key, the heart. Right. That's a very good point. And you've grown Care South to what you said, 600 employees, which is phenomenal. Adding services along the way. And one of those services in particu- particular is pharmacy services. Would you tell us why this particular service is so important to the uh, population of people that you serve? You know, pharmacy services mean more than just handing a person a pill bottle, Uh, in our setting at least, because like I tried to describe earlier, we look at an approach to the care of the individual in a team-focused Um, type of relationship. So when you have the pharmacy and the pharmacist there, you're creating another level of relationship and trust and confidence. A lot of times a a person won't tell the doctor some of the things that they'll reveal to a pharmacist. So you're able to add more trust and confidence, get things revealed in a pharmacy by the pharmacist that otherwise the patient wouldn't, wouldn't really feel comfortable in telling. The pharmacist helps them understanding 
what their medication is for, why they've taken it, how they should be taking it, and what to look out for when they do take it, and the importance of taking it. So it's, it's with medically underserved rural populations, it is invaluable beyond belief. And so if, if Care South was not providing additional pharmacy services, and you provide pharmacy services in how many of your locations? Nine. Nine, Nine of our locations. So, and you're in, in some of the, the counties that have the, the patients with the, some of the greatest challenges in terms of health uh, and wellness. So if you weren't providing pharmacy there, this real time, you, you've, you're being treated for a condition, you get your medication in most cases at the same visit. If you weren't doing that, where would these patients be going in these rural communities for their prescriptions? Honestly, in some of our locations, I have no idea. Uh, we are in some communities where there, there are zero pharmacies. And, you know, I, my, my heart goes out to independent pharmacies. They, they have a real struggle. They can't offer the medications often according to the patient's ability to pay. We can do that. We can help the patient address these financial barriers. So number one, if the patient had a, a transportation, which the majority of them don't, to get to a local nearby larger town with a pharmacy, They'd have to they'd have to overcome transportation barriers, work hours. Um, it, it's a real, real broken system of access to medication for many, many patients. And, and, and having the pharmacy on site allows the pharmacist to talk with the physicians or mid levels about the, the course of treatment and what's what's trying to you know, what they're trying to do and what the medicine's designed to help. Bingo. And that that. Uh, that same day access, the the, pharm- the physician or the provider can pick up the phone and say, look, I really need to change this hypertension medicine, but I'm not sure where the next best place to go. I'm not sure what what you know, are the all the contraindications. Providers can't keep up with everything around the pharmaceuticals. It's a it's a nightmare as it is. But that consultative uh, visit between the pharmacist and the provider is invaluable. It makes a major difference. Right. So we know that entities like pharmacy benefit managers or PBMs or pharmacy service administrative organizations, PSAOs, interact with healthcare providers to to have an impact on pharmacies and, and service pharmaceutical services. Tell us how those type of entities interact with FQHCs. I'm going to do my very best on this. I am not an expert, and I actually had to consult with my chief pharmacist to say, okay, now tell me how all this works. And here, literally, I studied on this before we had this podcast. So a PSAO, think of it as a clearinghouse. They help the provider, the, the pharmacy, develop the contract. There are myriads of contracts with payers. So when payers see that you have a PSAO, like in our case, HealthMart Atlas, they know that P- that PSAO knows about the contract language, knows how it works, so to speak. They know the routes, they can negotiate the drug uh, prices and all of that. So it's, a, it's like almost an intermediary. Right. The PBMs are different, however. They pay the PSAOs. They are the ones that decide what medications and what's going to be um, the ultimate provider of that particular medication. For it. And these are people that everybody probably knows. If you have any insurance of any kind, you've heard of Express Scripts, Caremark, all of those are PBMs. They can decide, uh, well, I'm kind of depending on their contract, if a particular pharmacy is even in their network or if they're going to allow that particular pharmacy to fill that med. Okay. A lot of control so, there. Yeah, so we've got the physician or mid-level provider who treats the patient, evaluates the patient, makes a clinical decision about what drug that that patient needs, and some of which are life-saving or or, or chronic drugs that they would be in serious uh, danger if they didn't have these drugs. They write a prescription. 
that is filled by the pharmacy in the Care South example that's on site in nine locations in these uh, underserved areas of, of the state of South Carolina. A PBM would somehow, and that's for another podcast, insert itself in between the patient and the pharmacy and clinician, correct? Correct. Okay. That's the and, exact flow. Yeah. And um, how easy is it for a patient, particularly the patients that you serve, to understand and manage that, that PBM decision-making process to interact with it? Almost impossible. You know, yeah. when, when, when that drug gets um, denied by the PBM, then your provider has to think, okay, do I want to jump through all of the hoops that I'm going to have to jump through the time consuming paperwork, uh, even if it's on a computer, it's still paperwork, all of that to get Ann Lewis that particular medication that I think she needs. And I'll tell you, it has gotten to be a real, real time consumer. Wow. So the patient is almost um, uh, handicapped. Yeah. It's very difficult. It's very, very difficult, difficult. For, for a patient by themselves to manage the PBM landscape. I know my wife is a physician. She gets on the phone talking to sometimes physicians, but most of the times not physicians at these PBMs and other um, similar entities to make the clinical case for why the patient needs the drug and why it should be covered, which which was not when you started uh, at Care South. That was not part of the physician's job to be a, a, an administrative advocate on behalf of patients. But that's at, and at Care South. How often do your providers serve in that capacity where they're trying to get a drug approved, working with whoever's making that decision? Oh, four or five times daily. And right. if we we're providing an IV infusion, it is with almost ex, without exception almost every single IV. And, right. and, right. and the, the providers are so frustrated. I mean, they went to school, they learned how to do this, and now there's someone, you made the point, in most cases, it's not even a physician telling them for who knows what reason, you can't order this drug for your right. patient. Right. Well, we'll we're going to have another podcast that hopefully you'll be a part of to talk, get a little bit more into to details, but let's let's hear a little bit more about uh, what Care South has it planned for the future, Heather? Uh, yes. Although Matthew, I have this perplexed look on my face yeah. because I'm like, "What? Yeah, you know, yeah. who owns these things? Like, how does this happen? Yeah, who owns the PBMs? Yes. Yes. Well, that's a good question. And you got any idea about that? <laughs> you know, I have Farm, tried the to drug get, companies. I have tried to get to the bottom of this. I really have. You know, and 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 payers. Uh, like our private insurance payers, <clears throat> our payers for Medicaid, they're the ones that contract with the PBMs, but trying to get any of them to fess up if they own the PBMs, I'm not having any luck. Yeah. But I'm right. in Washington. <laughs> to yeah. be and, continued and, and on that, I guess. we will say that, that there are lots of states passing laws to address how PBMs are regulated, including South Carolina, which okay. we'll talk about in, okay. in the future. Okay. Okay. Um, well, what about, let's look to the future. If we're on the frontier and look ahead and tell me what's ahead for Care South and your patients. You know, <clears throat> I have just been at a meeting where I had the experience of being able to have this exact conversation with folks from CMS, uh, CMMI and some of the other divisions of CMS also. And, and here's exactly what I told them. We are facing a mental health crisis in America. Today, this month is Mental Health Awareness Month. At Care South, we have over 20 behavioral health providers. But right now, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, or what have you, with the tsunami <clears throat> of mental health needs that are coming through, we need the ability to do brief uh in, in well, like, like brief assessments. Medicaid, right. none, of the, none of the payers pay for those. They only pay for psychosocial uh, interventions. And we need the brief 15 minutes just to be able to meet some immediate needs. The other need I talked about, it is time that we realized in healthcare that it is not just medical, 
um, or even dental or behavioral health. These psychos these social needs of patients, uh, food insecurity, homelessness, or, or shall I put it, interval living conditions, <laughs> um, and transportation are just the scratch on the top of this big problem. We need healthcare to acknowledge. We are expanding our our efforts in both of these areas. And um, I think that's the wave of our future. And that's the way to reduce costs if you get that's to right. the root if you get to the root of some of these issues. Because healthcare today it has been about treating the problems after they have arisen. Whereas what Ann's talking about is trying to prevent the problems from coming up. Bingo. <laughs> And it sounds like we're fortunate to have you in South Carolina no for so that. long. Um, I hope you press on and continue to press forward for your patients. It sounds like you will. But I'm, I'm, I, on behalf of Matthew and everybody here on Taking the Pulse, thank you for taking the time, especially while you're traveling, to join us today. Thank you. For those of you who joined us, we hope you learned a little bit more about community health centers, as Anne likes to call them, and the good work that's underway in the PD. We are always open to your ideas for guests here on The Pulse, so shoot them to us. And until next time, be safe, be well. We look forward to seeing you on Taking the Pulse, a healthcare and life sciences video podcast. <laughs>